Good morning. Welcome to Shutesbury Community Church this morning. We are so glad to have everyone here on this beautiful summer day. Let us uh, go to our invocation and Lord's Prayer. Holy Father, we are so grateful to be here this morning, worshiping you and expressing our deep love for you, Lord. We are grateful for all you do for us. We're grateful for the sunny days that we have. We're grateful for the rain that comes to keep the flowers and the grass uh, colorful for us. We're grateful, Lord, that you give us air to breathe and that food to eat and places to live. You are a good and loving and faithful God, and we praise you this morning. And we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your sacrifice on the cross. And so we repeat the prayer that you taught us to pray this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So the painting of the church will be complete tomorrow. And I hope you've had a chance to look around. I think they did a great job. There is some cleanup that I hope they're going to do. And they're not quite done with the front. They're not quite done with the sign. Uh, but all the walls and, and whatnot are done. And I think the church looks great. So we're very, very grateful to all of them. We do have a thank you card for everyone to sign that we're going to be giving to the guys tomorrow who did the painting. And we're able to return 13 gallons of paint. Um, which is going to save us a good deal of money, which is excellent. Next Sunday, though, we have to vote on the money for the paint that we've already put on the side of the church. Um, and that will be right after the service. This afternoon at 2 o'clock is Johnny Mac's installation at, at the church at 793 Main Street in Lancaster, if anyone would like to go, uh, there will be at least a few of us going. <clears throat> Johnny Mack has been a good friend of this church for a long time. Uh, John McKenzie, the one in the wheelchair, uh, in case you don't recognize the name. So, um, we all are invited to attend that. And we're thinking about a movie night on July 29th, that's a Friday night, and we'll show the movie... Miracles from Heaven. How many of you have already seen Miracles from Heaven? That's about the little girl with a very serious disease, and she ends up falling down a hole in the middle of a tree. Anyone see that? It's an excellent, excellent movie. Queen Latifah has a great role in it. And uh, it's all about Boston and this area, so it's kind of cool. Um, so we're looking at doing that for July 29th. And that's all I can think of. Anyone else have any announcements this morning? I hope everyone's having a wonderful summer. And it's good to see that so many people are here today uh, on such a beautiful summer day. Let us go now to our worship time and sing our praises to the Lord.
righteous. It is a thing for the upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to Him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all He does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of His unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm.
Oh Lord, you are the hope that is alive in us. And we do sing hallelujah for the hope that you have given us, Lord. We live in a world that struggles in so many different ways. A world with hatred and violence and discrimination and prejudice. And yet, Lord, you have provided us with this amazing hope and joy that we can carry in our hearts because you are a good and loving God. And although the world seems overtaken by sin, we know that there's another world, one that we have been promised we will get to go to when this life is done, a world of joy, a world of peace, a world of rest, a world where there'll be no more tears, no more death, no more pain. And the hope of that carries each one of us through our days as we look around at the world we live in now. Helps us to stay above the pain, the sorrow, the difficulties that we live in and keeps us moving forward toward you, Lord. We pray that you will help us to keep our focus on you, that you will constantly be with us, we know you are, but that you will also help us to constantly be with you and not turn our backs and not turn away. Lord, there is much to pray for in this world. We do pray for the countries of the world where there is turmoil, Christians are still being killed on a regular basis in many countries. And it's a terrible thing and we pray for them. We pray that these things will, will end with the coming of Jesus and we look forward to that. We pray for the leaders of the countries of the world. We pray for Putin that he will stop this foolishness of attacking Ukraine and having his eyes set on other countries around Russia. And we pray for the Ukrainian people who have suffered so much death and so much hardship and millions and millions of them have had to leave their homes and are now elsewhere eking by a living, barely a life like they had before. We pray that we can help, Lord, with that. That we as Christians can extend our love and can, can extend our resources to help those people. We pray, Lord, for our own country where there is dispute and dissension all around us. We are grateful for some of the compromise that we have seen, but there remains to be such a need for compromise and for listening to one another, for understanding one another, for sharing in love the leadership of this country and not have such dissension and division as we have now. And so we pray for that too. We pray for our community here in Shutesbury. We pray that people will come to know you that they will come and fill this church as a place where they can worship you. And we pray that we here in this church will be a beacon and that we will extend the love of Jesus to all our neighbors and all our people, all the people of this community. Lord, we pray today for those who are ailing in whatever way, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. There are so many types of pain, hurt, and misery. And so we pray for Carla, and we pray for Becky, and we pray for Peggy. We pray that you will heal them, Lord, and anyone else. We pray for Scott, who finally I've heard from, and he's okay, but he is failing. 
We pray for all these people, Lord, and we take just a minute for people here and at home to pray for their loved ones and to pray for, uh, to lift their praises to you. We pray, Lord, for Chris, who is getting better, and we thank you, but still can't manage the stairs. And we pray for Jonna, who continues to struggle with the chemotherapy. And we pray for Johnny Mack, whose installation is today, and we're just so grateful, Lord. And we praise you for leading him into the ministry. Uh, he is such an inspiration to so many. I have a little prayer here from um, <clears throat> from Peggy, asking that we pray for persecuted Christians, and that we praise the Lord for the tall green trees. Wish I'd had this for the invocation, and the green leaves and green vegetation and that we thank you for being with Peggy's daughter, Dot, and her family. We pray for our Armenian missionary in Armenia and be with her and her teams during the summer camps. And we thank you, Lord, for the Tom Turkey and the three something and seven little turkeys in the neighborhood down there, three hens and seven little turkeys. Lord, we do thank you so very much for the blessings of this natural world that we get to see around us and we get to experience on a daily basis. And it is just further proof of your goodness. So we lift all of this up to you, Lord. In the name of our holy Jesus, amen. <clears throat> it is time for our offering this morning. So if Phil could uh, come and take up the offering, I would appreciate that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I do have a little offering message today. Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, as the Bible says, had just started out on his journey to Haran to find a wife. And he had an encounter in a dream with God. You know the story of the ladder with the angels going up and down. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but most of you have heard of that. Well, Jacob was overwhelmed by this experience, and so he made a, God, a vow to God in Genesis 28, 20 to 22. It says, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Well, I personally don't think that our giving back to God should require that he does first give to us, as Jacob is suggesting here, but he in fact does give to us and provide to us very, very many things, an abundance of things. And so we do, I think, have a responsibility, and the Bible tells us so, to give back a portion of that for the work of God. And so those of you who are at home today, you see the ways that you can make a contribution to God's work here in Shutesbury um, on the screen. Let us rise and sing the doxology.
Heavenly Father, you do bless us so greatly in our lives. And our greatest blessing, of course, is Jesus Christ, who gave us the promise of everlasting life. And so, Lord, as we receive those blessings from you, we give back a portion for your work in this church, in this community, and around the world. And we pray that it will be used in your will and always to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we continue this morning with our Places of the Bible sermon series. And one of the fascinating things about the Holy Land that I'm learning, I mean, I guess I knew before, but I'm really learning now as I dig into all of this, is the great variety of landscapes, the differences in geography and topo topography from one location in Israel to another. It is such a small area. It's part of the reason we love New England, because we got mountains and we got seashore and, you know, we've, we've got rivers and whatnot. But Israel is even more diverse than that. It's only 263 miles from its northern point to its southern point. That's from um, Concord, New Hampshire to New York City, roughly. And it's only at its widest point, it's only 71 miles wide. At its narrowest, it's only eight miles wide. 71 miles is how much you drive from here to Boston. And that's it. That's, that's Israel. And yet within the tiny, this tiny land's 8,000 square miles, there are numerous mountains, the tallest of which is the snow-capped Mount Hermon, which is Mount Hermon School, where I went, is named after that. Mount Hermon is nearly a mile and a half high, and the snow never leaves it. And the very deepest valley on earth is in Israel. The area of the Dead Sea, which is a quarter of a mile below sea level. So you got one of the highest and the very lowest in the world in this small area. The Negev Desert, one of a couple of deserts that are there, the Negev Desert itself is 4,600 square miles. Now remember, the whole country is only 8,000 square miles, so that's substantially more than half of the country is desert. And yet, it has fertile plains and hillsides that are well known for their grape production, for olive trees and olives and citrus fruits, and of course, raising sheep and, and whatnot. So it's very diverse, and in addition to all that, it has 273 miles of shoreline with beautiful beaches, with rocky shorelines, with busy ports. So it's an amazing place, just an amazing place. So as we've been looking at various biblical locations in our Places of the Bible Summer Series, we've looked at several, several different types of landscapes so far. Today, we're going to the sea. And I love the ocean. That's one of my places. I was telling Ann just a couple days ago, got to get away again. Really need to go get peace, sitting on the rocks next to a harbor or something. Today, we're going to Phoenicia. Two Phoenician cities that were actually supposed to be part of the promised land. But the Israelites failed to obey God's commands when they conquered Canaan, and they failed to get these two cities for the Promised Land. They are Tyre and Sidon. They're now part of the country of Lebanon to the north of Israel. So let's take a look at, the, at a map and show the location of these cities. Tyre is, they're both in red, to the left-hand side of the map. Tyre is the lowest one. Tyre is about 35 miles northwest of uh, Capernaum, which is right on the Sea of Galilee. And Sidon, Sidon is 20 miles north of Tyre. So they're both, you know, within spitting distance, less than the distance to Boston from where Jesus was 
uh, spent most of his ministry time. The most famous reference to Tyre and Sidon in the Bible, I think, is a statement by Jesus that was recorded in both Luke and Matthew, which he stated to the 72 disciples before he sent them out to spread the word about the God's kingdom coming. And Jesus says in Luke 10, 13 to 14, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Now, that implies that Tyre and Sidon weren't the nicest places. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But before we look at the significance of Jesus' statement, let's look at the history of these two cities for just a few moments. Archaeological discoveries have determined that there were ancient peoples at both of these sites going back thousands of years. And you would expect that because they're right on the seacoast and they're in fertile areas. So here's a picture of Sidon today. And in the foreground there, that is a fortress that was built on an island in the harbor by the Crusaders during the Middle Ages. This was a, a big area for the Crusaders. They attacked it in the 1200s, and they took over Sidon and Tyre. So there's a lot of Crusader remnants still there today. Tyre was actually two cities originally. One was on the mainland, and one was an island that was a half mile off the mainland. And in 333 BC, Alexander the Great attacked Tyre to take it for Greece, which he took most of that whole Mediterranean region for Greece. And when he couldn't attack couldn't get through the fortress city because they had walls 150 feet high around the island and they had all gone in there. And he built a causeway across this half mile of harbor so that he could get his soldiers over that causeway and take the city. So here's an aerial photo of Tyre today as you can see, that causeway has now been expanded over the many centuries, and the island is in the foreground, and out in the background is the, what used to be, you know, what was the, the, the harbor, but now it's been built up and it's part of the whole city. In the late second millennium BC, both cities along with many others around the Mediterranean, around 1200 or so BC, the Phoenicians, a great seafaring people of the time, expanded their uh, territory and they defeated a lot of these cities, including Sidon and Tyre. And so these two cities became Phoenician cities. And they remained under Phoenician control a thousand years until Alexander the Great was able to conquer the entire region. And that included Judah and Samaria, Samaria that uh, Alexander the Great defeated. And that began the occupation of Judah and Israel that continued into the Roman era and right up until 72 AD when the Romans destroyed those countries and scattered the Jews. Both Tyre and Sidon were prosperous because of their good harbors, which enabled trade with cities all around the Mediterranean. They also had successful industries, including glass making. They were very famous for glass making throughout the Mediterranean region. And the production of a very expensive purple dye called royal purple. And it's still, I think, called royal purple. Um, and it's made from seashells harvested in the Mediterranean, from a shellfish in the Mediterranean. Both cities worshipped pagan gods, the primary one being Baal. You've heard that many a time. 
In the Bible, Tyre and Sidon are frequently condemned for their worship of pagan gods. Um, Baal, Asherah, Malkart, and others are gods that, uh, that they worshiped. On the screen now, there's a statuette of Baal that was discovered in an archaeological dig in Tyre that is now in a museum somewhere. So that's how they honored him. The archaeological dig is next, is the next picture. This started out as a dig of a necropolis, which is a, a Greek name for a cemetery or graveyard. A necropolis uh, from the second century AD, but as, <coughs> excuse me, as they were digging it, they discovered a necropolis from 1100 years later, the 9th century BC, going back that far. And so they are continuing to excavate both the second, second century AD and the 9th century BC necropolises at the same time. And here's a picture of a Phoenician stela or grave marker from the 9th century BC that they discovered. Fascinating and beautiful, truly beautiful. So let's look at some of the references to Tyre and Sidon in the Bible, starting, of course, in the Old Testament. Sidon is first mentioned as not a place, but a person. Noah. We talked about a couple weeks ago, and you all know the story of Noah. Noah had three sons, and one of those sons, Ham, had three sons, and one of those three sons was Sidon. And so that's the first reference we get to Sidon. Just four verses later, we get a reference to Sidon as a place, and obviously it's a place that was named after the son of Noah, Sidon, uh, the grandson of Noah, Sidon. Verses 18b to, 18 to 19 say, Later the Canaanite clans scattered, and the borders of Canaan reached from Sidon toward Gerar, as far as Gaza, and then toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. Now Canaan was in that line from Ham, and so... That's where the word Canaanite came from. Now you notice that in this quote from the Bible, it mentions Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zebel, Zeboim. And those are all cities that were destroyed by God in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. There were five cities destroyed, and two of the other ones were, were Adma and Zeboim. So we see from the very beginning the Canaanites, the descendants of Noah through Ham, uh, were evil and pagan-loving people. So these were cities of infamy. Noah, you recall, there was an incident involving Ham shortly after they got off the, the uh, ark, and Noah cursed Ham at that time and said that his descendants would be cursed. And so we see that happening even in those very early days as they began to spread out. Well, as time continued, the curses continued. And in the Old Testament, we find that the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, and Zechariah all cursed from God through them the Canaanites the descendants of Ham. And we'll look at just one. Ze Zechariah 9, 1 to 4 says, The word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach, and will come to rest on Damascus, and on Tyre, and Sidon, though they are very skillful. Tyre has built herself a stronghold. She has heaped up silver like dust, and gold like the dirt of the streets. But the Lord will take away her possessions, and destroy her power on the sea and she will be consumed by fire. So it did turn out that Sidon was destroyed by the Babylonians in the fifth century BC, and after being rebuilt, it was destroyed yet again in the 12th century AD by the Crusaders. Tyre was destroyed, 
as we mentioned, by Alexander the Great in the, the uh, fourth century BC, and then also by the Crusaders in the 12th century. So God, in his time, and we have to always remember that God doesn't live in our time. He lives in his time. He is, he is always, God is always. And so he has no, no time, in, in a sense. It's hard to explain how that is, but he is in all time at all times. And so at his time, he brought these curses to bear upon these cities. The next time that Sidon is mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Joshua, when God tells the Israelites to take all of the land of Canaan. And God is very specific. He says, way back when Abraham is coming into Canaan, he says, you will have all this land. This will be the land for you and your descendants. But it is not time yet, because the people of this land, the Canaanites, are not evil enough yet. And so 420, 430, no more than that, almost 500 years goes by before the, the Israelites under Joshua come up and cross the Jordan River. And God says, these are evil people. You will take all of their cities. You will destroy them. And then this will be your land. Well, when they got across, they weren't so good at that. They left a number of cities still existing. They tried to live cooperatively with evil people. And so what happened, paganism worked into the Israel religion. So Judges 10, 6 to 8a says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aaron, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. They were disobedient. They couldn't follow the rules that God set, and they kept turning away from God and making idols their gods. For a short period during the reigns of King David and Solomon, Israel actually had a good relationship with the Phoenicians. 2 Samuel 5 tells us that about David conquering Jerusalem, another city the Israelites had failed to take. Imagine, when they first came in, they didn't take Jerusalem, which became, finally with David, the site of their temple 500 years later, when David finally conquered Jerusalem which was right in the middle of their territory. So it says in verse 11, Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent envoys to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. Hiram, the Bible tells us, respected not only David, but respected David's God. Now, he was still a pagan, and he still worshipped other gods, but he had great respect for David's God. And David allowed him to provide all these things for his palace. That good relationship with Hiram, Hiram continued into Solomon's reign, where Hiram, Hiram provided cedar and juniper logs, as well as four and a half tons of gold for the construction of the temple and Solomon's palace. Now, obviously Hiram was extremely wealthy uh, royalty, and he was able to provide all of this. The relationship, however, finally soured when Solomon decided to return Hiram's generosity, and he gave Hiram 20 towns in Galilee. And 1 Kings 9, 12 to 13 states, But when Hiram went from Tyre to see the towns that Solomon had given him, he was not pleased with them. What kind of towns are these you have given me, my brother, he asked. And he called them the land of Kabul. Kabul sounds like the Hebrew word for good for nothing. 
So he gave him 20 good-for-nothing towns. The irony, of course, here is when the Israelites came into Canaan, they didn't take all the towns they were supposed to. And here we are, um, 600 years later, and Solomon's trying to give some of them back to the pagans rather than keeping them. The God, the, those towns that were gifts from God. Unfortunately, wood, <coughs> gold, and workers were not the only things that Solomon got from Tyre and Sidon. Best known for constructing the temple, Solomon is also well known for his great number of wives. Don't we all know about that? 1 Kings 11, 6, uh, 3 to 6a states, he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. As a result, God said that he would tear the kingdom that Solomon was king over in half. And that Solomon would only be left with one of the original tribal territories. He actually ended up with two, Judah and Benjamin. And the rest became Israel. And this happened, we talked just a couple of weeks ago about um, Solomon's son was going to continue the policies of his father and the Israelites to the north weren't happy with that arrangement and they chose their own king and went their own way. And so the kingdom, the united kingdom of Israel was split in half into Judah in the south, Israel in the north. Now it turns out that, that uh, Solomon wasn't the only king of Israel who committed this sort of sin. We come a um, hundred years later to King Ahab. That's a famous name, not just because of the, the movie and book about the great white whale, but it's also a famous name in the Bible. Um, Ahab turned away from God by marrying Jezebel. And Jezebel was the daughter of King Ethbaal of Sidon. And so here we go again with this allowing the pagan gods to come into the house of God, the house of David, and causing problems. So Ahab, who really wasn't a nice guy even before this happened, became a less nice guy, and he began worshiping Baal, and he built an altar to Baal in Samaria. And he put up Asherah poles to worship Asherah in the mountains. And he and Jezebel even began murdering God's prophets, the Lord our God's prophets, and then replacing them with prophets of Baal, a total of 450 of them. And it was a terrible time in the history of Israel because they turned away from God to such a great extent. It was a time of great sin. And it contributed to God's decision to completely destroy, destroy Israel at the hands of the Assyrians just a century or two later. And the Israelites were scattered all over the world for millennia. So that brings us to the New Testament and to the statement by Jesus that I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. So Jesus is holding up Tyre and Sidon as places of great evil and separation from God 
And yet, our God is a God of second chances, isn't he? And he gives even places of great evil like Tyre and Sidon the opportunity for salvation. Jesus Christ had among his followers people from Tyre and Sidon. And he treated them with the same love that he gave to the Jews that were with him. The same love he gave to the Sumerians, whom the Jews hated. And in the third year of his ministry, Jesus traveled to Tyre and Sidon, where one of my favorite miracle stories happens. So let's read Matthew 15, 21 to 28 together. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, <clears throat> crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his di disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Jesus shows us in this story that he came not just for the Jews. He came first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. He came not for just a chosen few. He came for all people, for everyone who might have faith in him. Now, some people think that this particular story is harsh, that Jesus is denouncing this woman, calling her a dog, and just being terribly harsh to her. But what I see here as this story progresses is Jesus taking his time, but giving an opportunity for this woman to confess her faithfulness, her own sinfulness, and to show him her faithfulness. And he could have simply had her removed, as the disciples suggested. He could have just said, get her out of here. You know, that's what a king would have done, right? You're bothering me? Get her out of here. Take her away. And they pick, them, pick her up by both arms and carry her out. Well, he didn't do that. After his initial silence and then a denial of her, he conversed with her. He gave her the opportunity to persuade him of her faith. Bible scholar David Guzik, in his commentary on Matthew, suggests that Jesus went to this Gentile region for one reason, to meet this woman and heal her daughter. I don't know if that's true. I don't know. But he says, Jesus went all this way to meet this one Gentile woman's need. This shows remarkable and unexpected love from Jesus to this woman of Canaan. And then Guzik adds, we are at the great disadvantage of not hearing the tone of Jesus' voice as he spoke to this woman. We suspect that his tone was not harsh. We rather suspect that it was winsome with the effect of inviting greater faith from the woman. So the Jews regularly used the word dogs to refer to pagans. It was an everyday thing. And whether Jesus used that word in a harsh way, <clears throat> or as Guzik suggests, in a playful way, maybe with a touch of sarcasm, I don't know. There's no way to tell from this. But what we do know is at the end of this story, Jesus extended to this woman a great miracle. He healed her daughter and a great compliment. Only two times in the, all four Gospels 
does Jesus tell someone or even say about someone that they have great faith? Only twice. One is this woman. She has great faith. The other, interestingly, was also a Gentile. The centurion whose son Jesus healed in Capernaum. In that case, he didn't say it directly to the, to the centurion. He said it to the crowd. This man has great faith. When Jesus left Tyre, he continued on to Sidon and then returned to Galilee. And the Bible doesn't tell us what he did in those days, perhaps weeks, that he was traveling in Tyre and Sidon. But what the Bible does tell us in the book of Acts is that by the time Paul the Apostle, 20 to 25 years later, visited Tyre on his way to Jerusalem, and he stayed a week with the Christians there. Now, were those Christians the result of Jesus' visit? We don't know. Or did, it, did they come later? But my feeling is that Jesus didn't go there for no reason whatsoever. And if he only went to Tyre and healed the woman's daughter and then went back to Galilee, then I would maybe could agree with Guzik, but he went, went to Sidon. Why did he go to Sidon? I think he went with a purpose, because I think everything Jesus did was with a purpose. Tyre and Sidon were obviously evil places, prosperous places, full of money, very, very successful businesses, and, and worldwide at that time trading. But they were evil places. But what Jesus showed us by going to those two places outside of Israel, outside of Judah, is that he is willing to go to evil places. He is willing to talk to evil people. He is willing to offer his love and his gift of salvation to anyone, no matter what's in their heart. He offers to change their heart, to fill them with goodness through the Holy Spirit. That's the great difference between Christianity and almost every other religion, maybe every other religion. It's not just for a chosen few. It's for everybody. It's funny, though, how it seems like so few choose it, choose him, when he's available to everybody. Christ makes the same offer to everyone. Believe in me and I will give you eternal life. He does not limit salvation to a chosen few. He off his offer of grace extends to everyone, including you. So I pray today that if you haven't already done so, that you will accept Jesus' free gift of grace today. Because there is no better way than the gift of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Jesus Christ. Jesus, we are so grateful for what you did for us, that in traveling around the countryside and into the cities of your time on earth, that you taught us so many lessons, showed us so many things about how to be good people, that you gave us such immense love and continue to give us such immense love and that wonderful, glorious offer of salvation. So few take advantage. Use us, we pray, Lord, in helping to bring some to you through the love that you've put into us so that more will take advantage of that wonderful grace that you give so freely. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Our final song today is Mighty to Save. Again, one of my favorites. <clears throat> Everyone needs compassion. 
passion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. My life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine a light and let the whole world of the risen King. Jesus, shine light and let the whole world see. We're singing the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the After we finish today, Veronica would like to speak to everyone for a couple of minutes. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And may you now go in peace, carrying the love of Jesus in your heart and sharing it with all those you meet. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. So there's another